so now I have a one question for you guys. How many of you have heard the name or know about Fanny Crosby? Okay, that's a very small number, right? Now, how about how many of you know the songs Blessed, Blessed Assurance or To God Be the Glory? Well, that's a huge number. So actually, Fanny Crosby was none other than the author who had written these songs. So now we have our preteens from Sunday school who are here to represent and also sing the songs that Fanny Crosby has written. So I request you to please put a round of applause and welcome them. Throughout the history of the Christian church, hymns have built a bridge between the tangible world and the spiritual realm. Hymns have offered comfort to the grieving at funerals, jubilation and promise during weddings, and hymns have echoed compassion and hope during times of war. The early 1800s was a time of growth and conflict for the young nation of the United States. It was then into this world that Francis Jane Crosby was born. John and Mercy Crosby were blessed with their first child, a daughter, on March 24, 1828. Frances Jane was born in Putnam County, 75 miles north of New York City. The Crosbys were people of simple means, making a living of the land. As an infant Fanny contracted an eye infection, the family physician from the nearest village was away. So the Crosby saw the aid of another country doctor. What are you doing? Hot muscle polish on ice? Madam, I am a physician. I know what I am doing. When the man was finished with his treatment, Fanny quickly lost all sight. Baby Fanny was blinded. It was later learned that the doctor was not a qualified doctor. He left town after learning the results of his destructive prescription. When Fanny was nearly a year old, the family was struck by tragedy once again. Her father John had become ill while working his land. He succumbed to pneumonia a short time after. Mercy, now widowed, was forced to take a job, leaving young Fanny in the care of her mother. Fanny was an adventurous and curious child, talking in the sounds of the fragrance, fl fragrance flowing around her. She would even play hide and seek with other children, finding her way by the sound of their breathing and avoiding obstacles by sensing their shadows. This encouragement of vivid childhood experiences is what laid the groundwork of Fanny's poetic 
mind in conspiration of visible things the wind across her cheeks the thunder clapping in the distance and the sounds of nature formed a heightened sense of wonder that molded her spirit and poet's vision her family was a significant influence in Fa- fanny's formative years her grandmother spent long hours reading the bible to her fanny observed the scriptures like a sponge she could recite much of the new testament proverbs ruth and several other books of the bible thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemy her unparalleled powers of memorization and love of the poetic were to become the tools of her trade trade and the means to change the lives of so many people fanny was very unique as a blind child because of the fact that she was ne- never treated at home as a blind child she was taught to do things just like other children other people and that's wrong francis so you've got to show them that you're different you're going to have to educate yourself because they can't teach you in a normal school do you understand francis yes grandmother this kind of nurturing from her family gave her an optimistic outlook on her life Although Fanny was content with being blind, she was unwilling to fit into the box that society would put blind people. She yearned for more. Dear Lord, please show me how I can learn like the other children. From the time Fanny was 8 years old, she prayed every evening that God would find a place where she could learn. She would go attend the local schools, the regular schools, but the teachers at that time did not know how to teach blind students. So to cover their own inadequacy, they would tell her that she was stupid and she couldn't learn and send her home or they would just let her sit there just sit in class while the other children read and went out for recess institution for the blind was opening its doors this gave young fanny the opportunity that she had been praying for at the age of 15 with her mother's assistance fanny applied to the school pensions that you have been selected school dr ras encouraged fanny and she came to deeply respect the principal whom she found out later in life had worked for two entire years without drawing a penny in wages the new york institution for the blind was a unique and new type of schooling so everyone politicians and famous people went to visit the blind school to take a look at it and fanny was the important residence 
which meant that any time someone came to visit the school, she would recite one of her poems as a welcome to them. So she came to know everyone who came through there, all the presidents, politicians, and famous people. During her lifetime at the school, she came to know 22 of our presidents, from John Quincy Adams to Woodrow Wilson. On one of these dignitary visits, William Calder Bryant, a, poor, a famous poet of the day, came across some of Fanny's work. Crosby? Yes, Francis Crosby, please stand up. Francis Crosby, an excellent young lady. Excellent. I have been reading your poems. Yes, I have. And you have the making of great poet someday. But you have to work at it. I shall absorb your future with great interest. He only gave her a few small words of encouragement, but Fanny was deeply touched by Brian's small offering of inspiration. Years at the Institute, while academically fulfilling, offered Fanny many opportunities to be the mischievous and playful child that she was. On one occasion, she even snuck a watermelon from the school's garden an act of rebellion on behalf of the students who were upset that the fruit was going to be sold before they could enjoy it. Upon her graduation, the institution offered her a teaching position. At the age of 22, Fanny was put on the school's payroll and began to instruct young minds on the wonders of rhetoric and history. This position not only gave her a respective place in society, it also gave her a platform from which to recite and circulate her creative verse. One year later, in the autumn of 1843, Frances was given an extraordinary opportunity, hoping to gain financial assistance for the blind. The New York Institute sent Fanny and the others to address Congress on Capitol Hill. This audience, including John, Quin John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, and Jefferson Davis, the only man to ever be the president of the Confederate States of America. Fanny Crosby was to be the first woman to ever address the Senate and Congress. I think of that rustic village, secluded as once it stood with its dwelling soul and pretending Fanny selected several of her favorite poems, and when it was time for her to speak, recited them with understanding convention. The words spoke for themselves. When she had finished reciting the first poem, there was a prolonged period of silence. Unable to see the faces of the audience members, she began to dread that their silence signified disapproval. She was completely shocked when a thunderous wave of applause suddenly washed over her, overwhelming her keen sense of hearing. In 1855, the New York Institute hired another blind prodigy, Alexander Van Alstein. Although their relationship was very friendly for several years, Alexander and Fanny's relationship blossomed into love. 
In the spring of 1858, Fanny ended her 23 years at the institute to marry Van Alstine, a union which was to last for 44 years. They moved to Masworth, a part of Queens. Fanny had looked forward to have a married life and motherhood. Her joy was unrestrained. Alexander insisted that Fanny use her maiden name since it was already so well known and so although she was legally a Frances Van Alstine she was always known as Fanny Cos- Crosby Van Alstine wrote the music for several of Fanny's hymns but he lived quietly in the shadows of her success The following year Fanny gave birth to their first and only child, a baby girl. Fanny was ecstatic, but tragedy was about to strike again. They lost the child in infancy. She was just a few months old when they lost her, and Fanny and Van never really spoke publicly about it. It was the worst experience either one of them had ever gone through, and neither one of them dealt very well with it. Following the death of their only child, Fanny Crosby and her husband sought comfort at church and attended regularly. The hymn that she wrote, Safe in the Arms of Jesus, was written as a poem for her baby when she died. Even today, that hymn continues to comfort people devastated by the loss of a loved one. In 1873, Fanny was visited by her best friend, Phoebe Knapp. Phoebe and Fanny were very good friends. They did a lot of things together, shopping and all the girl things. Well, they were visiting one evening and Phoebe sat down at her husband Van's piano and began to play a tune. She told Fanny, God has given me this tune, but he has not given me any words to fit it. Does God give you any words to fit in my tune? And in the next five minutes, she put together the words to Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine.
been an old standby that continues to echo through thousands of church services. In her time, Fanny Crosby was immensely popular in this type of music. She made well over 10,000 hymns before the age of 43. By 1906, the hymnal series, Gospel Hymns and Sacred Songs, to which Fanny had contributed had sold over 15 million copies worldwide. Fanny donated all her royalties to a collection of charities and seminaries. Indeed, she died with only $2,000 in her estate. She was a humble, generous, gracious, giving woman and payment for tune were not important to her in the least. That's one of the reasons she's such an amazing woman when you consider her life and her legacy. It was the morning of February 12, 1915, when Frances Jane Crosby finally saw her savior. Fanny's funeral was the biggest port, biggest port, bridge port had ever seen. People lined up for blocks to view the coffin and many dignitaries and politicians attended. Fanny had insisted a simple grave, preferring the money be used to help the poor and needy. Initially, her small, her small gravestones carried the third statement. She had done whatever she could. In 1955, the citizens of Bridgewood replaced the stone with a more fitting tribute. The chorus, the Blessed Assurance, now forms the central portion of her epitaph. Fanny Crosby had never shown resentment or regret about being blind or about the charlatan who took her eyesight in infancy. In fact, she appreciates the fact that her disability gave her deeper insight into spiritual matters. A century has passed since Fanny Crosby has written most of her hymns. Throughout that century, she has rung out more than those of any other songwriter in history. The New York Institute for the Blind is still going strong as an educator of blind children. Though others have deeply contributed to its cause, Fanny is still recognized as the school's most treasured alumnus. The last verse she wrote was not one of a despairing and dying moment, but one of a joyful, hopeful saint about to see joy face to face. Christmas is a season of hope. With everything going on in our world today, it might be tempting to give in to despair, but it is important for us to remind ourselves that hope is not a naive wish that our situation will improve, but it is recognizing that God loves each of us now and always, just as he loved Fanny. When someone asked Fanny that if she was upset because she is blind, she told, No, because when I die, the first face that I will see will be that of my Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the hope and faith that Fanny had in God. So should we. Now, may the love and hope bought by the newborn King bless you and all the loved ones this Christmas season and throughout the new year. To God be the glory.
to go.